Well, good morning and welcome to Christchurch. It's so wonderful to have you here. <laughs> I got a little wave from Doug. That was lovely. Good morning. <laughs> Yay. Morning. Lovely to welcome you at home. You should join us from there too. You're so welcome. Uh, today we are going to be thinking again. We're looking at Matthew. We're going to go back to Matthew's chapter 13, thinking about uh, the parable of the weeds and uh, the wheat in there. So we'd love to concentrate on that today to ask God, would you open to us, reveal to us what it is that you are telling us today? Uh, As we get started, we're just going to take a moment just to pray, just to become expectant, ready to hear his voice. So love to welcome you just to take a moment now. Oh, Heavenly Lord, we thank you that we have the joy and the privilege to come and worship you together. Lord, would you come and be with us? You are welcome here. Come and rest upon us. Come and speak to us. And Lord, out of thankfulness and gratitude, may we worship you wholeheartedly. And whatever's on our hearts and minds today, we place them before you knowing that you are a faithful God. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do stand as we worship together. Heavenly Lord, we thank you that you are the rock on which we stand. May you be the firm foundation of all of our lives. In your name, amen. Amen. Please do be seated. We're going to spend a little bit of uh, time just thinking about a way in which we can be God to other people, bring God to other people. We can be God's hands and feet. So I've just got a quick question for you, which I'd love for you to ponder and to think about. And then if you wish to, you're comfortable, we'll chat to the person next to you about this. But 
Has there been, or can you think of an example where you have seen God at work through someone and they've never even mentioned God's name? So has there been something where you have seen God at work in or through someone and they've never mentioned his name? So I'd love you to think about that. And then if you have, just have a little chat to the person next to you. Well, I'm taking from that hubbub that we've got across the A, what are you asking for, Jude, to, ah, yes, I get it. Times when we have seen God at work. So it might be through the foyer. You've seen people at work through that, the way in which they chat and which they welcome. It might be a way in which someone has shown kindness and generosity, a way in which they have shown the likeness and character of Jesus in their actions. Well, we're going to be thinking today about Operation Christmas Child and our shoebox appeal. And if possible, we'll see if we can watch something. So let's see. The war still goes on and uh, we are all tired. Uh, we're all tired going through a difficult time. We are strong in our faith, but without resources we cannot bring victory to our country. We're here for Operation Christmas Child right now. This year, we've given out the 200 millionth shoe box in 30 years, 200 million boxes. It's hard to fathom 200 million, but it's something God has done. Every box is important. The 200 millionth is not any more important than the person who gave the first box. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, being able to be on the other side, to be able to pack a shoebox and being able to deliver a shoebox to children in Ukraine, is just an absolute privilege. This country has suffered incredibly. And it's, it's still suffering. These children, this is just a chance to, to put the war behind them for a few minutes, for an hour or so, and it gives us a chance just to love them. At this time, people's hearts really soften. They are looking for hope. They are looking for future. Something good has to be in this world among all of the atrocities people go through. When the gospel was presented, I prayed that their hearts were opened and the seeds of gospel were planted in those hearts. I know that they felt love today. I know that they felt the hope and love of Jesus. In the midst of war, we know that He is a powerful, He is bigger than all of this. And the fact that Operation Christmas Child is able to come into this country and continue to deliver the gospel, is, it's incredible. It just shows you how amazing our God is. So that is just an example of one of the places in which Operation Christmas Child takes these shoeboxes into places whereby children would not be receiving anything at Christmas, maybe have never had a toothbrush before or even a new toy, and it's a way of sharing God's love and sharing his hope in what can seem like hopeless situations. And we know we come in with that, not just with something beautiful and something lovely and something to be treasured and 
joy that is brought through these shoe boxes, but you might have noticed there that alongside this is an opportunity for people to hear God's gospel as well. And so there is that opportunity for the both and. So every uh, adult, every parent is invited to ask whether their child would like to be part of a discipleship program to hear about God's story in addition to also receiving the shoebox. So not only are they receiving something through actions, but they're also hearing through words the gospel too, if that is chosen by their adult. So our opportunity is to do what we heard a little glimpse of in there, is we can be partakers in that. We can share by bringing together a shoebox. We have some flat pack shoeboxes over here, if you would like to take one, if you haven't got a shoebox at home, or we've even got some that have been started. Look, people have already started to bring some in, which is wonderful. Um, we do have some that we got wonderful, lovely Helen Whitley, who over the year has been wrapping shoeboxes. So if you're one of those people that thinks, oh gosh, I don't want to wrap a shoebox or I haven't got a shoebox available. And if you would like to take one, they run out. We have got others available. But what we're hoping to do is for everyone to take a leaflet. You all got one last week if you're here. If you weren't here yesterday, last week or you forgot about that, we have got some at the back of the church too. It explains everything that we're doing, but the hope is that everyone will be able to uh, participate some way in our shoebox appeal. And it might be by creating a shoebox, putting things in. There's a whole list of do's and don'ts of what is appropriate, what's inappropriate to put inside of it. But also, every single shoebox we can be praying into. So even if you're unable to put together a shoebox yourself, maybe you could pray for this whole operation that's taking place. And also, if you want to give financially, you can do that online. We encourage you to go to the website itself and do it that way. If that's a little bit... Um, too difficult for you, then Alison um, Frost will be very happy to collect that and sort that out for you if that will be easier for you to do. But we'd love to encourage you to start thinking about creating a shoebox. Can you and your family put one together and bring one in? That will be amazing. If you can do more than one, that's fabulous. But we're just trying to encourage people to serve and give in this way. Our deadline is the 5th of November, so that is why we're telling us now, so it gives us a couple of weeks to get ourselves sorted for that. So I'd love for us just to pray for a second, just to pray for this and for the blessing that it is to so many. Oh, Heavenly Lord, we thank you uh, once again for Operation Christmas Child. We thank you for the hope that they bring and the joy that they bring and the fact they bring you into so many places and people can see you at work. And Lord, that we pray that this year in particular, that hearts will be stirred and people will come to know you better through this. And Lord, we pray for our gifts and our offerings. May you be with that. And would you multiply them as you do in your economy and let it bless so many in your name. Amen. So we're going to spend some time now. Um, our youth and our children are going to head to uh, their venues, and I'd like to encourage you to stand the rest of you as we continue in some worship. Thank you. 
such praises. What of the splendor of shines the sun? What of the majesty rules with justice? the holy God indeed well good morning everyone in the basics, asking what how and why and there's so much more to explore together new stories new adventures new loves new joy we're born curious stay curious try alpha coming didn't you because <laughs> it is coming the alpha course starts on the 27th of this month um still time to invite to decide to sign up yourself um it doesn't matter how long you've been on this christian journey 
there's always a good time to do the Alpha course. I've done many, many Alpha courses, and I learn something every single time from people's stories, from the discussions. There's new questions all the time. So I really do encourage you to sign up. Sign up to help. Um, I know that Lisa still needs practical help as well. So if the Lord lays on your heart that this is really important. I said to her, well, just tell everybody it's not running because we don't have enough people. It's the salad cream principle. Have you heard about that? Heinz, um, I think about three times, have said that they're going to uh, withdraw salad cream <laughs> because the sales have gone down. People haven't been buying it. And they go, you can't do that. It goes right back to my childhood. We've got to have salad cream. So they launch it and all the sales go up. <laughs> so do you seriously think about that. Speak to Lisa. It doesn't necessarily mean committing every week, but as much help as we can in the, in, in the sort of back room to make sure this can be a wonderful experience for those who come. And I can see faces around here of people who have come to faith or uh, have grown in their faith by um, being on Alpha. And I'll tell you something, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for Alpha. Um, so that's one. Notices. We have a few. In fact, we have an extended one in a moment. So read Newslink. That's the main one because it does come out every week. Um, and as far as we're able, everything that's going on, is in there. So there's lots coming up. We've got a midweek communion on the 20th. We have a bereavement support group are meeting on the 25th. Alpha starts on the 27th. We've got harvest on the 1st of October. I don't expect you to remember all this. Look it up. Um, on the 5th of November, it's the car rally. We're going to do the same as we did last year, which is just have one service at 11 o'clock um, so that we can serve our, our guests who, who visit. If you haven't seen it before, it is amazing. All these old cars come in. We serve them breakfast, and we just the whole place is given over to that. And then we have a service at 11 o'clock um, after that. So that's on the 5th. Uh, live Nativity is on the 16th, so more donkeys. Um, Alpha course I've mentioned. There's a first aid course, uh, and there's still spaces to sign up for that at the end of the month. Uh, what else have we got? Harvest is the 1st of October, um, and we'll be all together for that. Midweek fellowship. We're going to Eastbourne. Yay! Is Alison here? If you want to know more, speak to Alison. Um, Today, there's an open worship session um, for the 5 to 18. So after the third service, gathering here and just making a joyful noise, learning how to play together and just having fun. So um, that's for our young people. Parenting for Faith course starts on Monday the 25th. We're joining in with one which is um, running uh, online. So speak to Jude if you're interested in that. We're doing something on Halloween. Uh, a sing-along in Kanto. Christmas child. 200 million. 200 million boxes. That is three times the population of the UK. Do you realize that? Isn't that incredible? Over 30 years. It's amazing what, as, as Franklin Graham was saying there, what about that first box? <laughs> Did they know what was coming along? Uh, pretty much support group. Oh, the Black Light course starts on the 28th of September. Um, and it's we did this last year it's a it's a wonderful place to explore some of the issues around racism but also to find ways to move forward from that uh, particularly in an anti-racist way so if you want to know about that speak to me i'll talk to you about the course um, and we would love to put some more people on that and peace together is starting soon as well and there are one or two other things in there Loads of stuff, news term, loads of stuff going on. Do read the news link to keep up with what's going on because, um, it, you know, the number of times we say, oh, I didn't know about that. We sent it to you every week. <laughs> so please do click on that. Have a quick scroll through. You don't need to read the whole thing, but um, have a look at what's going on. Now, could we have the slide? That's the one. I'm going to have the next slide. I just wanted to make an extended notice uh, today. If you, how many people read the blog? <sighs> Eye roll emoji. <laughs> um, if uh, that's fine, it gets longer and longer every week. I know. I write it. Um, if you 
don't normally read the blog, please read the one this week. It's really, really important, and it is intended for absolutely everybody in the church. And it is about safeguarding. Um, you may have seen some additional or renewed news in the, in the news this week about Soul Survivor. I'm not really going to talk about that this week. It, it's coincidental that we're talking about that today. But it, again, it raises, again, some of the issues around safe church. Um, and so what I wanted to do is one of the things, and coming back off sabbatical, uh, for, for a couple of reasons, which I won't go into now, um, it's really important that we raise the awareness of safeguarding for the whole church. Um, because it is everybody's responsibility to make this place safe. Uh, and so it's just really to say that. So we've got a line here. Everyone protects boundaries and vulnerabilities by reporting. I still don't know if that's cheesy or not. But it captures really kind of some of the five main elements of being a safe church. Now, it is undeniable that the church in the past has not been safe. And there are survivors who bear those scars today. So the reason this is important is to make sure, as far as is possible, that that doesn't continue to happen. So it's really, really important. Everyone protects boundaries and vulnerabilities by reporting. So it's everyone's responsibility. There's, a, there's, there's always a risk, and there has been for many years, that we've got clergy, we've got parish support, uh, safeguarding officers, and we've, we've filled in the paperwork to get a DBS. So we've ticked the box, therefore we've done what we need to do. Actually, it's so much more than that. It's about having a culture of being aware of concerns, which means it's everybody. Now, different people would, would react in different ways if there were a concern, but it's everybody's responsibility to be the eyes, the ears, and it says they're the heart of a safe church. So this is for everyone here and everyone who's not here. So everyone, protect. Safe church intends to protect the vulnerable and the innocent. That's really important. Because there's this kind of narrative which is, oh, we couldn't do that because of safeguarding. And it's like it's this negative thing. And, you know, it's, it's understandable because sometimes we can't do things in the way we want to because of the things that we put in place. But we put them in place for two reasons. One, to protect the vulnerable, and that is primarily children, anybody under the age of 18, and those who are over the age of 18 who have some form of vulnerability. Um, it's to protect them, but it's also to protect the innocent. So to give an example, we say that you shouldn't be on your own with a child. Now, if a child is harmed, they fall over or you know, whatever happens, and there's nobody else there to witness it, then the finger points at you, the adult. So safeguarding is there not only to protect people from harm, but also to protect other people from accusation. So um, it protects the vulnerable and the innocent. And where we have a church which is obviously making every effort to be safe as possible, then perpetrator, perpetrators, and we will hear later today in our reading that there are people who wish ill on others, will be put off because it's not a safe place for them to do what they want to. Does that make sense? This is so important because it's so important because we need to get it right, but it's so important because the church has historically got it wrong. But we've moved, we're moving away from there. And if anything, the church is safer now than it's ever been, sadly because of what's happened in the past, which has come to light. So everyone protects boundaries. So boundaries might be physical, they might be emotional, they might be spiritual. We need to respect people's space and we need to not put ourselves in a position where something could be misinterpreted as well as some harm could take place. So we gave the example of not being alone with the child. It relates to touch. It relates to proximity. It relates to the words that we use. It relates to a whole manner of ways in which inadvertently or by design, harm can take place. So we need to respect boundaries 
And if, if there's a place in which safeguarding gets a bad rep, it is about those boundaries. But they are so important to have in place. And vulnerabilities. Power imbalance is always in place where abuse takes place. Somebody has a greater power than, than others. And that's a very sort of complicated thing. You know, as clergy, we, you know, there's this bizarre deference towards clergy or whatever, um, which is true, but actually some have abused that. And we might not even know it's there. In a conversation, if I'm wearing a collar and you're not, there is an imbalance in power, even if we don't recognize it consciously. So always think about, is there an imbalance in power here? So again, talking to or um, uh, praying with a child, for example, as an adult, there's an automatic imbalance in power. And so that's why we always uh, relate to the parent before we do anything with the child. And we make sure that other people are involved as well. And then reporting. If we have a concern, we need to report it. We have professionals in the diocese, diocese safeguarding team. They are brilliant. They are experienced. They are level-headed. And they are hard-headed as well because they'll deal with difficult cases in the way in which it's got to take place. Um, so it's not our job to solve, to um, investigate or anything like that. We literally just say, I have a concern about this and pass it on to the professionals and they will then guide us. People now know that if they come to me with something around safeguarding, my first thing I'll say is phone the dials and safeguarding team and get the advice. And they're very happy you know, if we go to them with something minor and they say, no, that's okay, you can deal with it locally, you don't need to worry about that. They'd rather have that conversation than pick up the pieces once it's a horrible mess. And so early reporting of concerns is really, really important. So everyone protects boundaries and vulnerabilities by reporting. It maybe is cheesy, but it is the essence of what we need to be, our culture needs to be, to make sure this is a safe space for everyone. Is that okay? Now, that may raise a number of questions for you today or later. We'd love to have kind of follow-up workshops or something like that, just so that we can continue this conversation and, and be encouraged by this. You know, it, it's, not, it's not to add, place an extra burden on everyone. It should naturally be who we are so that everyone can remain safe. Is that okay? So this will continue that work. I was going to say any questions, but we'd probably better move on. But if you do have any questions, catch me at the end. And uh, I'd love to build those questions into, into some follow-up work as well. Okay. I don't think there's any other notices unless I've forgotten. Could I invite Pam to come and bring us our reading, please? <clears throat> We're having another reading from Matthew this morning. And it's from, um, starts at verse 24, uh, chapter 13. The parable of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping... His enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. 
At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And often after we have a reading, we say, this is the word of the Lord, and you all say, thanks be to God. And sometimes there's a reading, you go, I don't really want to say thanks for that one. It's a hard, hard message. And it follows on from the, uh, the parable of the sower that we had um, last week. And again, Jesus explains to uh, the disciples what this particular parable is all about, that there are... Um, the, the seed in the parable of the sower, the seed um, was the word of God um, and the, so, the good soil was understanding that word. This time he uses seed, but he's talking about the people that have been placed there to receive that word and to move into the kingdom. And yet there's this enemy who comes and plants a different seed um, and that is evil. So there are three main characters in our reading today. First, we are told about the end times is coming and that harvest will be at the end and therefore there is a judge. So the first character is the judge and of course that is Jesus. The devil is active, that's the enemy and there is evil in the world. And thirdly, we're told about the angels will come to do God's will. They're the harvesters who separate out and root up the, um, the, the, the plant of the evil seed as opposed to the plant of the good seed. And these are recurrent themes throughout Matthew's gospel. So what I'd like to do is a whistle-stop tour of these themes and then come back to what that means for us today. Matthew, we remember, is writing to a mainly Jewish audience, and Jesus is revealed as challenging much of the religious teaching and practice of the time. And that was based on keeping the law and this assumption that the people of Abraham, the children of Abraham, would be saved, that the Jewish people would be saved. So, an angel appears first in chapter 1 and encourages Joseph to marry Mary, and then issues a warning to escape Herod and to go to Egypt. John the Baptist then comes in in chapter, uh, chapter 3 and speaks urgently to the people and the religious leaders about uh, the one to come, Jesus, who not only baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire, but also holds a winnowing fork to separate the wheat from the chaff, the latter, the chaff, is going into an indestructible fire. So therefore, very clearly, John is saying there is a judge and he's coming. Jesus, post-baptism, is sent into the wilderness where he meets the devil and who tempts him. And the second temptation, of course, is that um, the angels will save him if he fell from the highest point of the temple. Jesus fends off these temptations with scripture, and the devil leaves him, and the angels tend to him. Jesus then begins to preach, and his opening words are, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The same message as John gave, turn away from your sinful life and turn to me. By chapter 5, Jesus teaches on the mount, and he affirms the law and the prophets and his destiny, his personal destiny, is to fulfill that law and that the, the message of the prophets and the law will remain intact until heaven and earth disappear, looking forward to the, his coming again and the rolling up of creation and the new creation. He later encourages the building up of heavenly treasure, not earthly material possessions, which do not last. They rust and the moths will eat them. The kingdom to come is both eternally valuable and is forever. It's all good news, but there is a judgment. Chapter 7 contains the instruction to enter via the narrow gate because the broad road outside it leads to destruction. 
Only a few will find this narrow gate. And a few verses later, we hear that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. In fact, Jesus will say to some, I never knew you. Those who build their lives on the rock, Jesus, will withstand the winds, while those on foundations of sand, not Jesus, will crash. The crowds were amazed at this teaching, which had such authority, and he offers an either-or. It's not a spectrum. A decision has to be made. In chapter 8, we hear of the faith of the Gentile or non-Jewish centurion. Jesus is so impressed with his faith that he uses this as an example of the fact that many from all nations will enter the feast at the end time. So another picture of what that end time looks like. We've heard of a harvest and now it's a feast. But that some from God's own people, described as the subjects of the kingdom, in other words, the Jewish people that that Jesus was preaching to, will be thrown outside and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hold on to that phrase. By chapter 10, Jesus has sent out the 12 in mission. He explains that it will be hard, but with an encouragement that the believer's soul is protected from people and not to be afraid, but that they should be afraid of the one with a capital O who can destroy body and soul, referring, of course, to God. And again, referring to eternal judgment. Hell and judgment are real. And in a terrifying follow-up, Jesus says that whoever disowns him before the Father, he will disown. Do not think I came to bring peace, but a sword, he says. Jesus, mental, uh, mental, no, gentle and meek. I don't think this is. In chapter 11, Jesus turns to the cities who have seen his miracles and not responded in repentance and faith. And he speaks woes over them, equivalent to those facing Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom, all of which were bywords for God's displeasure and worthy to incur God's wrath. Here in chapter 13, where today's reading lies, Jesus acknowledges the work of the enemy, the devil, who takes seed and plants evil seed. In this parable, unlike the sower last week, the seed does not mean the message of the kingdom, but those who receive that message. And the role of the angels in the end times are also highlighted. So I quote from verse 49. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Any reading of the Psalms will show that the wicked come out badly in the end and that the righteous, those right with God, find his favour, his mercy and his grace. This latter is good news. The coming of the Son of Man with angels is reaffirmed in chapter 16. More woes to the world are proclaimed where things or people cause others to sin. Woe to the man through whom they come, it says. It is not therefore just our own behaviour and proclamation that is under scrutiny, but also the effect that our model and our teaching has on others. By chapter 19, we are guided towards the need for a simple, childlike faith to enter the kingdom. Not the rich man and his independent wealth, but the child with the simple submission. The vineyard worker's parable reminds us that the last will be first and the first last. It's those who are poor in spirit and know it that are blessed. By chapter 22, Jesus is in Jerusalem. It's Holy Week and the teaching intensifies. Chapter 22, we are given a picture of the wedding banquet. So not only is it a feast, but it's a wedding. The groom and his bride, which is the church. The one ill-dressed and unprepared guest is thrown out with, yes, you guessed it, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is an open invitation to dine with Jesus, but few are chosen. 
Chapter 23 is a series of woes to the religious elite. How will you escape being condemned to hell, they are asked. Integrity and faith is important, but not man-made religion and practice. One chapter later, Jesus talks about the signs of the age to come. How dreadful it will be that we cannot guess when it will be. But we will see the Son of Man in the clouds, angels arriving to a trumpet call. And in chapter 25, we have this story of ten virgins, but only some are ready for the groom for the wedding. It's another picture of the final consummation of the new creation. Then there's a story of unused talents or gifts that lead to the ungrateful recipient, the one who buried them in the ground, being, yes, you guessed it, thrown out with weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Son of Man comes with angels, sits on his throne, and separates the sheep, the doers of good, caring deeds for others, from the goats that did not, the latter of whom are destined for eternal punishment. Living out this faith is a demonstration that we truly possess it. We don't earn grace but our hearts that God can see reveal if we truly believe. The gospel, of course, ends with the great commission where Jesus claims that all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. The victorious Messiah and Saviour claiming to be all-powerful and that will come again as judge. Well, that was Matthew's gospel. As we can see, there is this recurrent theme in Jesus' teaching, in this emphasis on the kingdom. As Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, and encouraged all believers to pray the same, that is both a process and a destination. The kingdom broke through in the incarnation of Jesus, but it is a glimpse of what is to come. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that we see through a glass darkly, but that we will see fully when it comes fully, and that is only when Jesus comes again. So that process of ushering in perfection, for that's what it will be, includes a gateway, a judgment. Jesus was not a universalist. Not all will be in heaven. Some will not. So we cannot be complacent. And yet we shouldn't be depressed and fateful. What is to come is called glory for a reason. And it comes to the faithful. It is a promise. We have assurance. Not because of what we do, but because of what he has done on the cross. And not because of who we are, but because of who he is, our saviour. But, and this is important in the modern day, we are not the judges. So we do not determine our own salvation, but nor are we called to judgmentalism of others. The call to the disciples was not go judge people and tell them they're condemned. It was go make disciples and teach them all that I commanded. Give people the tools to live a life for Jesus, so that they will sit well before the mercy seat, so that they will know the glory of heaven on earth, where God will be our God, and we will be his people, and there will be no gnashing teeth anywhere to be seen. It just occurred to me this morning, There's no confession in heaven. Have you thought about that before? There's no need. Because we won't sin and we'll be with the Father. It's said that a Northern Irish brimstone preacher was preaching these verses and someone called out from the back, what if you don't have any teeth, pastor? (laughs) He thought for a moment and gave his answer teeth will be provided. (laughs) 
And we can joke, but this is deadly serious, literally. It is a matter of eternal life or death. And our verses today hang on three key ones, four, uh, possibly four. Verse 28, an enemy did this. Talking about the planting of the, the, the bad seed. The answer to why is there evil in the world or why is there suffering is answered in part here by Jesus. There is an enemy. Don't give him too much credit. We're still liable for our own free will and choices, but do not ignore him or deny him either. Stand firm and he will flee, we're told in the letter to James, but we need to have uh, to acknowledge him and his schemes first. It's important in this parable that the plants from the good seed, the wheat, looks very like that from the bad. It's thought that it's uh, darnel, which looks very, very like wheat. So sometimes in life it's difficult to tell. The devil is quite good at integrating with what's going on around him. This is one of the reasons that the weeding needs to wait until the end at the harvest where damage to the roots will no longer be a problem. Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. This world is not perfect and so we should not expect it to be. Frustration at inconvenience, suffering and poor fortune does not advance the kingdom. We are called to justice and mercy and promoting the goodness and righteousness of the kingdom here, but we should not be surprised or frustrated that things are not the way they should be. We had a fascinating discussion in PCC about evangelism being our focus. It was said that we should not abandon advocacy of environmental concerns in eco-church, for example, not least because it is a common concern with others and can build relationship. And I wholeheartedly agree it's not an either or, but a both and. Let's cry out justice for the planet and hand it back in good order to the one who created it and tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. But evangelism is showing faith in the hope of convicting others to give their lives to God too by the work of the Spirit of God is of primary concern and this parable is the reason. If all we have done until Jesus comes again is share concerns about the planet and the others have not received the invitation to know Jesus as Lord, then they may well or will miss out on eternal life. The works of God are to believe in the one the Father sent. That is why sharing good news, witnessing evangelism, if you will, is our primary concern. It goes on, at that time the harvesters, there will be a harvest, a judgment and a sorting. The angels will come and will separate us and all those who have lived before. I will tell first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. The judgment on some will be destruction and eternal separation from God. We'll be looking a little bit at the verses at the end of Revelation in the third service. If you want to hear a bit more about that. The unrepentant will not be in the wheat pile, but will be in the sheaves to be burned. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And it goes on, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. That was the verse I put at the top of Newslink this week. That's the good news. Judgment doesn't necessarily mean fail. It means pass as well for some. Others are due to spend the rest of eternity in God's perfect presence, just as they were made to do in the beginning. That is the purpose of life, being fulfilled eternally in the age to come. So on one level, this is a very simple message that's repeated and alluded to throughout Matthew's Gospel on the lips of Jesus by proclamation, by parable, and in prayer. A judgment is coming. The faithful and obedient will be judged well. The rest will not. 
It is a binary where Jesus is the arbiter and judge according to his good purposes and just judgments. He has shown us how. It's our decision to accept and to guide others in that way too. Now this is so key to who we are as a church and a Christian community. We need to continue this conversation. So I wonder if we could have that slide because I just want to close with four questions and then I'll close in prayer. So Jack, if you've got that second slide, that's okay. That one. So the first question is, do you believe this be, to be true? There is a judgment. Do you believe this to be true? And also that uh, not everyone will, will get in. Secondly, what does that mean to your own faith and discipleship? Now, don't be driven by fear of not getting in. Be driven by or called to obedience so that you will be judged well. What does it make you feel about others who do not know him? Jesus describes them elsewhere in the Gospels as the lost. Do we weep for the lost? And the final question is, what do you want to do about it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Matthew's gospel and that Jesus was so clear in so many ways about what is to come, about the wonders of the kingdom and what is required for the kingdom to come for us. Help us to be faithful, to be open to you, to be open to be led by your spirit and help us to share that with others that as is your heart, many more will enter the kingdom than are currently in that place now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I wonder if I could invite Lola to lead us in our intercessions. Good morning, church. As we lift up our voices in prayer, let us remember that despite the troubles we witness in the world, Jesus instructed us not to let our hearts be troubled, as he shared in John 14, 27, which states, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Heavenly Father, we thank you for leaving us with your peace, and may we hold on to this peace even in times of distress and worry, and be steadfast in the knowledge that you are the Prince of Peace. El Shaddai, we thank you for all your marvelous creations, which perfectly display your wondrous creativity. May we be better guardians of all you have provided us with and seek to be diligent stewards of our local and global environment. Within the last few weeks, we have witnessed the catastrophic natural disasters in Morocco and Libya that have resulted in the most tragic loss of life for tens of thousands of people. We lift up in prayer all those who have lost loved ones those that have been displaced and have suffered life-threatening injuries. For us here, it may be unfathomable to think of watching our loved ones being washed away by torrents of water, homes being disintegrated to rubble, and to only be left with nothing but the clothes on our backs. Tragically, this is the reality of so many at the moment in Morocco, and especially in Derna, Libya. May the global aid agencies with the proactive support of the international community, do all that is possible to provide the much needed support to those in need, as we strive to follow your command of love thy neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray for the areas of the world that are witnessing political unrest and conflict. We pray for Sudan, where large parts of the country have been experiencing ongoing violence since April, including intense urban warfare, gunfire, shelling and airstrikes, which has resulted in 49 people being killed in a single day this week. Heavenly Father, may opposing factions seek to find permanent solutions for peace. May your divine spirit of discernment rule in the hearts and minds of the leaders of war-torn countries and countries that are experiencing civil unrest. We pray for Ukraine as the war with Russia has resulted in 62,000 deaths and over 17 million displaced people. May the leaders of these nations, like King Solomon, ask for divine wisdom to rule the spirit of discernment and a heart for justice and equity that will bring about peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the borough of Croydon, and in particular, we pray for the forthcoming maintained nursery school consultation starting this week. We pray that those in decision-making positions will take into consideration the fundamental need of maintained nursery schools within the community as they provide affordable nursery placements for our young children to flourish and grow. May the welfare of the children and the community at large be placed at the center of the decision-making. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our church leadership, Doug, Lisa, and Jude, and our, wide church and our wider church community. We especially lift up in prayer the current vacancy of youth team lead, Jehovah Jireh, guide the individual you have selected for the role, working with our youth to further embolden their faith and support them in their ongoing walk of faith. May we together as a church family boldly live out our mission to make passionate disciples for Christ. May we not shrink when sharing our faith, but use our individual gifts to share the word, build your church, and help sow seeds that produce a bountiful harvest for your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us now have a moment of silence to lift up in prayer our personal prayer points, remembering that even if we do not know what to pray, what to pray for, the Holy Spirit will intercede for us. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Laura. I invite the band to come as we sing our closing song of worship.
Come to the closing blessing. Uh, I was looking at the parable of the lost sheep in Matthew, and it shows that the uh, the shepherd would be um, most pleased with that one sheep that was found. But this is Luke's version in Luke 15. Then Jesus told them this parable: Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let's take that out with us into the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Be with us and remain with us always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Remember the uh, third service starts at uh, 11.45.